So hello and welcome to today's Centre for European Legal Studies uh, seminar. And we're really thrilled to be able to welcome today Professor Colin Scott from University College Dublin to give uh, today's uh, seminar. Colin will be well known to, to many of you. He's Professor of um, EU Regulation and Governance at UCD. Uh, in, a, in other guises, he is a principal of the College of Social Sciences and Law and Dean for Social Sciences. Um, Colin's reputation is he's incredibly well known for the work that he, he does on, on regulatory policy. I think almost everything I know about uh, regulatory theory, regulatory policy, uh, regulatory spaces uh, is largely due to, to Colin. So Colin is a great honour for us to have you and thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today and Colin's going to talk for about half an hour about the emerging regulatory landscape for, for, for digital services and how we should begin to think and conceptualise a regulatory toolkit for carrying out that task. So without any further comment from me, Colin, great to have you. Thanks very much, Kenneth. It's uh, really delightful to be with you virtually today, and I hope uh, in, in person in, in future. And uh, it's a privilege to be able to talk in this wonderful seminar series. Um, I'm just going to talk for a moment about the motivation for the paper, and then uh, I've got some slides which I'll, I'll, I'll share. So the presentation today is very much a work in progress. The paper looks at the potential for deploying a regulatory toolkit approach to better understand proposed and potential mechanisms for addressing the policy challenges associated with uh, the digital society. The paper is motivated by a dissatisfaction at the way regulation is discussed, particularly in current EU policymaking. Uh, big tech firms, for example, often present their position as a willingness to comply with whatever regulation national or EU authorities may impose. But in my view, this is misleading as first, uh, big tech companies possess substantial regulatory capacity themselves, for example, through their terms of service and supply chain contracts. And second, because they are also key actors in making regulatory policy in their dialogue with uh, both EU and uh, national authorities. This is not to say that national and EU regulators and policymakers fail to recognize the dispersal of regulatory capacity, but rather uh, it is just frequently the case that discussions falls back to a rather monochrome model of state regulation and enforcement. What I'm talking about today, a toolkit approach, looks to the widest possible range of instruments and actors and recognizes that regulatory space is not empty before state regulation, but rather that regulation occurs through alternative acts and instruments in the absence of the state and regulating as a matter of working with the grain of the range of mechanisms, both state and non-state and range of actors who are involved in any particular regulatory space, in this case, relating to the uh, digital society. So following that brief uh, sort of introduction about motivation, I will now, if you bear with me a moment, I will uh, share my slides. So um, what I want to talk about now is um, in, in the presentation is uh, in this outline here. First, I'm gonna say a little bit about the nature of digital society and why it raises policy challenges uh, for us, some of which are new, others of which are old challenges presented in, in, in new ways. I'll secondly talk a bit about the emergent models of regulation in response to the challenge of the digital society with a particular focus on the EU. I'll then outline uh, a range of possible ways of thinking about how a regulatory toolkit might be developed, what it might look like. And then a principal focus will be on how a regulatory toolkit might be deployed in the digital policy area. And I'll conclude with something about potential research and policy implications. Um, so I'm going to start just with a, a recent uh, news story that was published in the Irish Times, uh, an article by a well-known uh, activist, uh, Johnny Ryan, uh, with the headline, uh, Ireland blew its chance to be super enforcer for online content across EU. Um, I'm highlighting this story because it demonstrates some of the key themes that I want to address today. So in this article, Johnny Ryan correctly says that there's been a good deal of controversy about 
the way that the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, um, has been enforced. Um, he presents GDPR, which was uh, adopted in 2016 and implemented with a date in 2018. He presents it as a model uh, in some ways for the future of regulation across a wide range of areas in the digital society. And a key part of the model was national regulators would regulate the tech firms or all the firms within their, the large firms within their, within their country. So Ireland became a key regulator and the Data Protection Commission in Ireland became a key regulator uh, for the whole EU with respect to the tech firms that have their European headquarters uh, in Ireland. And he argues in the article that uh, the Data Protection Commissioner has been insufficiently stringent about their enforcement, with the result that in the next stages of regulation in the EU, referring in particular to the Digital Services Act, a political agreement on which was reached uh, last month, uh, referring in particular to that, um, a different model is being chosen in which the EU, in particular the Commission, has much stronger uh, enforcement role than is the case with uh, GDPR. Now, I don't think anything is so wrong about what Johnny Ryan argues in, in saying that uh, a more centralized EU model is being adopted because of concerns about weaknesses at the, at the national level. But it also seems to me the picture is incomplete, in part because even with GDPR, whilst national enforcement has been a key part of GDPR. Uh, there has also been a massive cultural change in organizations, uh, public and private, stimulated by GDPR with a much greater focus on internal monitoring uh, and, and reporting and compliance through the Office of Data Protection Officers within, uh, within firms required by uh, GDPR. And it seems to me that uh, GDPR represents a mixed model of regulation, not a single state enforcement model, and that actually the DPO innovation has been a very significant part of the cultural change. We want to understand the weaknesses and strengths and successes and failures of GDPR. We must look internally at the culture of how firms regulate themselves, indeed how public bodies regulate themselves with respect to data privacy, and what is it that promotes compliance with GDPR? Is it the threat of enforcement? or is it having effective internal compliance mechanisms or perhaps a mixture of, of the two? So this article, as I say, sets up very nicely um, my, my theme because I think it has an excessive focus on state regulation and the shift to, in, this, in, in, in the D Digital uh, Services Act, the shift to uh, European Commission-based uh, monitoring and enforcement. Whereas in my view, uh, we should be looking at the wider toolkit. And I'll say something about the mix of uh, mechanisms being anticipated within uh, the new package of legislation in, in a few moments. So turning back, coming out back to the beginning, having illustrated something of the, the, the regulatory challenge, uh, I want to say something a little bit about digital society and the policy challenges it raises. I'm not going to cover this very fully, um, partly because we would be here all day if we looked very thoroughly at the digital society and its policy challenges, just a bit of a, a thumbnail sketch is what I will present. So I remember back in the days of the early 90s, the huge excitement around digitization and all the things that we could achieve once we could deliver much larger amounts of data down both the old technology of copper, copper wire and phone lines, but also the uh, so new and emerging technology uh, of um, fiber optic uh, cables. Um, and so digitization was you know, very exciting and was accompanied by, of course, the, the invention of the World Wide Web uh, in, in the period 1992, 19, 1993, which, uh, again, I remember uh, you're seeing the initial uh, web browser, Cello, developed by the Legal Information Institute in, in Cornell, and uh, going to the uh, website, as, it, as I discovered it was called, of the uh, US Supreme Court, seeing a photo of the justices and being able to download uh, judgments uh, from the court. I'd emphasize I could only download that at that time, judgments had actually been delivered. Um, draft Samostat copies of judgments weren't available uh, on that website, I think still aren't available on that website, but only through Politico. 
Um, but in any case, the, the digitization of, of, of judgments and photos and their delivery down, down, down the World Wide Web immediately seemed to me to be an absolute revolution for information management and sharing and access. And I didn't even think at that stage of all the commercial uh, implications and indeed the wider societal implications of digitization. So digitization leads then to a digital economy and so many different things that we do now uh, online, uh, largely through World Wide Web, but not exclusively um, through, through, through World Wide Web. Um, uh, cable TV, for example, provides another example of, of quite a revolution um, and uh, sharing of, of um, broadcast and other content resources. Uh, and the way that uh, digital technology become embedded in our lives through social media and, and, and other mechanisms in, in the workplace as well and for our holidays leads us to think about something even more, where digital is even more embedded, something we might call the digital society. And whilst the digital society uh, clearly has many things to commend it as uh, ways of enhancing our lives and what we can do and what can we achieve and how we can fulfill ourselves. And that is a reason that from a policy perspective, digital society is very strongly supported. Uh, and indeed the EU has a, a policy priority to establish a degree of technological sovereignty in respect of this space. Nevertheless, it raises many challenges. And uh, the digital policy problem set includes a whole range of matters relating to consumer value, AI and a lot of algorithmic decision making, uh, the implications of platformizing both our economy and our society through interactive uh, services of wide range of, of, of kinds, problems of distrust, problems of data privacy. And I've got a long list here, which I'm not going to um, uh, go through in, in detail. And uh, each of these policy problems has uh, policy of people working on them, uh, people, uh, of course, industry and NGOs engaging with them, academics uh, commenting and, and, and reviewing. And I think one of the key challenges in my area of interest in regulatory policy is there are so many policy actions uh, ongoing simultaneously addressing such a wide range of problems. It's actually difficult for anyone to uh, get an overall perspective on what regulation for the digital society uh, looks like. And indeed, having started on that task during a period of leave uh, during the first three months of this year, uh, I realized I may have been a bit mad to start out on with the ambition of looking at regulatory governance for digital society overall, because the, the range of policy areas, challenges, and indeed instruments that one needs to look at to get a, get a handle on, on what is happening is, is very wide indeed. Um, but there we go. Uh, I've started, so so I'll finish, as as they used to say in the uh, in the world of university challenge. Um, alongside my listing, uh, I've also sh showing here the World Econo Economic Forum um, uh, diagram, uh, which splits up the different challenges into six different sets: data standards, industry practices, assessing impact implications, ethics, values, and norms. Uh, the uh, business and economy of data and uh, laws and, and regulation. I, I find this helpful uh, analytical, analytically, but it, it doesn't fully show, I think, how these different six different sets of issues are joined up. And of course, there's the subsets of all these issues that are, are around the outside that you probably won't be able to read today, but you can follow up with the World Economic Forum if you are interested in that. So there's a lot of interest, I think, in how we think about all the different policy challenges arising from the digital society. As I mentioned, there are strong policy reasons to support the development of digital society. Uh, but then beyond that, when we think about the problems, should we think about particular sectors and issues, or should we think about behaviors and values, and the in, or, or should we think about the interplay between them? And should we be thinking just about problems of markets, or should we simultaneously be thinking not only about digital policy in markets, but also digital policy for society and also digital policy for governance, because clearly digitalization is very strongly affecting governance today through not just through algorithmic decision making uh, and AI, but also through other mechanisms for enhancing ways that we engage democracy, 
ways that we deliver and, and, and engage over administrative decision making and, and, and so on. So many policy challenges in, in the digital society that I'm not going to outline in more detail now. Thinking about the EU regulatory response, there's at least a dozen different areas of policy activity uh, which are currently being prioritized within the EU, um, addressing different aspects of the uh, digital society. As I mentioned, the Digital Services Act uh, was a uh, subject of political agreement in the EU last month. The Digital Markets Act, which in some ways is a partner piece of legislation, um, uh, acting in tandem with Digital Services Act, more on the on the competition side and the leveling playing field side, that was subject to political agreement in, in, in March. So there is definitely a moment uh, currently of really moving forward uh, digital society policies for regulation on a, on a quite a, a range of fronts. Looking over all the different areas of, of current activity, uh, I'll say a couple of things about the models that are emerging. The first is that, as with other areas of EU law and policy, there's quite a high degree of path dependence for what I call state-centred regulatory approaches, which deploy law and hierarchy uh, and, and some intensification of regulatory oversight, especially at the EU level. And in some ways, we can see this as following the trend uh, in, the, in the financial services area that followed the uh, financial crises of 2008 onwards and led to the establishment of new and more powerful uh, regulatory agencies and indeed a stronger role for the uh, central bank, European Central Bank in, in, in regulation of financial markets. Um, key aspects of this trend include um, moving from uh, a sort of network approaches to uh, in the EU to, to more agentified or agency approaches. Uh, examples in the communications area include BEREC in, in, in respect to data privacy of the European Data Protection Board. And in the draft Digital Services Act, there's proposed a board for digital services. And the draft uh, AI Act, there is a proposed European AI uh, board. And I think there's no doubt that they will become more uh, uh, agentified uh, uh, over time and fora for substantive decision making about the implementation of uh, regulatory uh, rules. Second feature, as I mentioned, is enhanced EU supervision, notably through the European Commission, both in the draft Digital Services Act and in the draft Digital Markets Act. Of course, a standard instrument within such legal regulation is to prohibit activities which are defined as illegal, and that's one of the features of the Digital Services Act. Uh, there is a role for national regulatory authorities. So Digital Services Coordinator is a mandatory uh, requirement for member states within the Digital Services Act, and anticipated that, like the European Commission, there may be a form of pyramidal enforcement with the capacity for education advice at the base of a pyramid through which there will be an ascent towards more stringent uh, 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 penalties, uh, in, including uh, including fines, and well, possibly in, in, in some jurisdictions uh, uh, imprisonment as well. And then a, a, a novel feature within both the DSA and the DMA is a, an approach based on asymmetric regulation and proportionality, under which uh, the larger tech companies, very large online platforms, online search, very large online search engines, those with more than 10% market share in the EU will be subject to, to more direct and stringent regulation and also risk analysis through the uh, European Commission. Uh, so that's a very interesting uh, innovation. But overall, these trends uh, tend to support the view uh, of movement towards a more hierarchical uh, law-based and indeed uh, uh, EU-centric uh, based approach to tackling some of the problems. But that is not the whole story, because there's plenty in the Digital Services Act to indicate alternative approaches to regulation being embedded within the uh, new regime. So I'll highlight a few of those here. Um, first, there's a commitment within the DSA towards developing standards and codes to support uh, norms for the sector. Uh, 
through industry and civil society uh, dialogue. And that I think the detail of that as we see it emerge, I think will be very interesting for finding ways to tackle changing and novel uh, issues around the effects of digitization on, on society. Second, there is very importantly a recognition of the importance of firms uh, in compliance. So in the in Digital Markets Act, uh, the very large firms are, very large interme intermediary firms are described as gatekeepers uh, with a whole range of responsibilities placed on them um, uh, as a result of that, recognizing their role essentially in regulating uh, who and how uh, people have access to uh, you know, major platforms. And the D Digital Services Act is a recognition of the important role that uh, the very large uh, firms play in content moderation and requirements around due diligence and transparency with respect to their uh, algorithms. And a lot of that is, is focused really on, on, on the firms and how they set themselves up to, 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 to behave and use their powers with respect in particular to uh, those who use their, their platforms. And as I mentioned earlier, in, in respect to GDPR, there's of course the Data, Protect, data uh, uh, Protection Officer, who is a very important part of the internal compliance mechanisms you know, within the firms. This is something that all firms and indeed public bodies are, are used to having a, a, an internal compliance function, in this case, with respect to data privacy. There are then responsibilities of industry self-reporting on compliance, non-compliance. We saw those in, in, in GDPR. They actually exist also in respect of earlier regimes around product safety and are a key part of the Digital Services Act. Uh, Digital Services Act also requires um, for the very large online platform providers third party audit of their compliance. So this is a sort of privatization of um, uh, monitoring uh, for, for compliance. That means that the, the firms themselves will, will bear the cost uh, and the assurance comes through uh, the reliability and independence of third party auditors. Of course, that raises questions. We know that third party audit hasn't always been successful in providing the assurance it's supposed to provide. We think back to, uh, to Enron, uh, for example. So that raises some important questions about how to ensure that that third party audit is, is, is credible. And then there are mechanisms for uh, empowering citizens uh, through private liability, uh, complaints and ADR systems, and also recognition of trusted flaggers, uh, people who um, take on a, a monitoring role privately and uh, firms are required to take particular notice of their requests around monitoring and taking down uh, content in, in, in breach of the rules, which I think is again very interesting. Uh, diversification of recognition of capacity for uh, oversight and, and monitoring within the, within the regime. So in summary, there is a strong indication of more centralization emphasizing law and hierarchy within the emerging EU regime for regulation in the digital space. But there's also a significant amount of um, development instruments and roles for actors that suggest a more uh, diffuse approach. But as the newspaper article I quoted at the beginning suggests, and indeed the tech firms suggest, uh, often we, we often think in a simple language of the state regulating more through rules. And a toolkit approach has, I think, the merit of laying bare the very wide range of mechanisms that can be used either in isolation or perhaps complementary with each other to achieve particular regulatory objectives. So a toolkit approach um, uh, moves us beyond a uh, state-centric regulatory state model to what's sometimes called uh, regulatory capitalism. It involves a range of actors and instruments, uh, not just state legislation, but also, for example, supply chain contracts as mechanisms of regulation. And we might today even think of a regulatory society in which we uh, match the ubiquity of policy challenges with an ubiquity of regulatory actions and see that in the digital space, nearly every action can have itself a regulatory dimension. Um, the things we do, so the things we do as citizens uh, on websites with uh, um, uh, crowdfunding of uh, responses and feedback, that has a regulatory effect through a sort of aggregated market mechanism. So we all, in a sense, have a regulatory role 
through our behaviors you know, within uh, the digital space. And so a regulatory society is perhaps a way we might be thinking in the future. And I suggest a toolkit approach offers some potential to think rather more broadly about actors and norms, to recognize first regulatory space is not empty, even prior to state regulation. Uh, market actors, NGOs have various means to develop and implement norms. Uh, and non-state actors are also significant in monitoring and enforcement. Uh, in the old usage of the term gatekeepers, for example, banks have been a key regulator around internet gambling through their control by the, the credit card mechanism. Methods of regulatory steering are not limited to law and, and hierarchy. And if we recognize that regulatory power is dispersed, uh, as say a form of what Clifford Shearing and colleagues talk about as nodal governance, then challenge, it's challenging to imagine any one policy actor having overall control of regulation. That is a, uh, an issue I want to explore further with the way the European Commission is thinking. Do, do the European Commission think that the EU can set all the norms and, and objectives around the digital space? Or is it the case that that will be dispersed, for example, through some of the work around codes and, and, and standards? And the final thing I say about this is that using a toolkit approach is not inconsistent with the EU's own approach. The European Commission Better Regulation Guidance and Toolbox are in the latest edition, November 2021. Uh, but I think that toolbox approach is not being so strongly applied, uh, consistently applied across all policy areas, including the, the, the digital area. So think about a digital policy toolkit. Uh, the approach searches for regulatory capacity, wherever it may lie, with government, in some cases, of course, with regulation, laws and enforcement, with firms, as I've mentioned earlier, with associations of firms, and also with, with NGOs, and indeed sometimes with, with citizens, seeks to match uh, uh, instruments responsively to the environment to look for not only, uh, I mean, some people advocate uh, non-state approaches because they're less costly, but I think the argument for non-state approaches to regulation is more about effectiveness and going with the grain uh, of, of the particular uh, sector. So looking at toolkit approaches, I've worked with a few different ones over my career. First, the, the uh, resources-based approach that the Christopher Hood uh, uh, set down with his, uh, um, the acronym of NATO, in which he says that the, the entire set of tools for governing can be summarized as consisting of, on their own or in combination, four different resource bases. First, nodality, which is about the capacity to collect and to give out information. So using the position of government at the center of information uh, to steer behaviors. A second is authority, uh, that's law and hierarchy, uh, you know, the making of rules, enforcement of rules. Third is treasure, which is about finance, the ability to collect taxes and then to spend money in order to deliver public policy options. And then the, the fourth is organization, the capacity through the employment and activities of public servants uh, to, to, to get things done. And uh, each of these, Hood suggests, is important to uh, delivering on public policy in, in different mixes. Um, the well-known approach by Lawrence Lessig uses more of a social organization approach. And I use a number of different synonyms here to capture the four different modes that Lessig talks about in his uh, very important work, Code, in Code 2.0. So some, some regulation is through community, network, social norms. Some regulation is through hierarchy, law, command, or oversight. Some is through markets, competition, and rivalry. And some is through uh, a fourth contested mode uh, that might be referred to as architecture, might be referred to as design, or indeed uh, you know, contrived randomness. But um, each of these uh, four uh, social organization approaches is distinct, but many ways of regulating actually comprise considerable overlap uh, between these. My preliminary thinking is that I would, in my work here, actually use the EU regulatory toolbox as the basis because, because the EU regulatory toolbox is already in play within the EU, has legitimacy as an EU way of thinking about how to be effective around regulation. So the EU regulatory toolbox emphasizes education and information. First, then, then the option of using hard legally binding rules, uh, 
third, the use of economic instruments, and fourth, a, a rather large catch-all category that includes soft regulation, recommendations, uh, the open method of coordination, self and co-regulation, and also uh, technical standards. Um, so I have some challenge, there's some challenges to me around the way that the EU regulatory toolbox is articulated. There are also some challenges about the consistency with which it is applied. But my intention in this work as it develops is to look more systematically at the way the toolbox has been applied and could be applied to think broadly about different approaches to regulation within the uh, digital space. So just to briefly outline the deployment of the regular toolkit in EU digital policy, um, I've taken here an adapted version of a policy cycle with five different stages in, in regulatory policy. And uh, we'll just briefly outline the range of choices, a preliminary view of the range of choices available at each of the five stages using a toolkit approach. So starting at the beginning of the policy cycle with what I call policy reflection around what should be the objectives and the instruments, there's a range of tools here, some of which are already much in, very much in play. Regulatory impact analysis, for example, is in play both nationally and, and at, at EU level. Uh, the regular toolbox, which is supposed to consider a very wide range of alternatives um, to uh, command and control regulation. In practice, my sense is the toolbox is deployed quite late and uh, law-based regulation is very frequently the outcome without proper consideration of other alternatives. The EU since 2015 has emphasized enhanced uh, consultation uh, over, over policy. Uh, there is an option to think about meta-regulation, which is the idea that there's already regulation going on in the space before we engage state regulation. One option would be to monitor uh, what goes on in the space and uh, maybe seek reports about what's happening. And if the reports are satisfactory, then observe and leave it again on with itself. Uh, but if there are obvious opportunities to steer towards better solutions, then to uh, require, um, without necessarily specifying what, to require some changes that better meet the objectives through a, a meta-regulatory approach, sometimes referred to as the regulation of self-regulation. There's been a good deal of experimentation in the FinTech area uh, uh, internationally with the idea of a regular sandbox the idea that you permit firms uh, a space where they can experiment with uh, new approaches and new, new norms uh, prior to the development of a fuller, wider application of uh, norms to those particular uh, uh, problems. And then in the work of um, uh, Chuck Sable and, and Jonathan Zeitlin and others, there's a considerable emphasis on using methods of deliberation and experimentation uh, to uh, learn better through and then and then have process of iteration to to learn better about what what uh, priorities uh, should be and how they can be addressed uh, in the policy framework turning to the norms and or standard setting uh, within the digital policy space there's a core choice between rules and principles which isn't a very clear choice because there's some overlap between rules and principles, but this has been much discussed in the context of financial regulation. There's a potential, uh, as the EU Better Regulation Toolkit makes, to use guidance or soft laws as a way of steering behaviors without resorting to so called uh, hard law. Uh, the Digital Services Act, as I mentioned, gives considerable emphasis to the development of codes of conduct uh, as a mechanism for engaging deliberation. Uh, to bring, bring develop norms through uh, dialogue. We know that private technical standards are very widely used and then implemented through uh, supply chain contracts uh, in digital and other policy uh, spaces. Uh, many of the big, big tech firms use their terms of service to regulate their users. And for many of the evils, which digital regulation is designed to address, terms of service quite properly provide a first port of call for regulating the behaviors of those whose behaviors breach the societal norms. And then there's also something about market community expectations, sometimes referred to as a social license to operate, 
we've seen over past years will follow the Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica, sc Analytica scandal um, that was a market response for from users of Facebook, uh, some of whom uh, deleted their uh, accounts. And we've seen very recently in the proposal for Elon Musk to take over uh, ownership of Twitter, we've also seen people leaving uh, Twitter in, in, in response, uh, indicating uh, uh, voting with their feet to indicate uh, what may or may not be acceptable uh, to the user community as a means of steering the behavior of the, uh, of, of the firms. Coming on to the third part of the cycle, the feedback and monitoring aspect of regulation. I've mentioned already the importance of self-reporting within both GDPR and the draft Digital Services Act. Audit, but also third-party audit and certification uh, is also significant. Traditionally in regulation, the hierarchical method, of course, is one of inspection, and that's not unimportant, but moving broadly out to, to, to the role of consumers and citizens, crowdsourcing through online reviews has become an increasingly important way of uh, regulating through aggregation in the marketplace of uh, the quality, for example, with respect to uh, hotels and, and uh, online uh, retail. I mentioned already supply chain contracts, which provide mechanisms for monitoring, not only compliance with uh, core norms around price and quality, but also for monitoring compliance with uh, codes of practice and other third party norms that may be incorporated into the supply chain contracts. And then I mentioned also already the um, gatekeepers as monitors, both the role of platforms uh, monitoring through their uh, uh, terms of service and through feedback, and indeed the role of banks and other uh, third parties who may have capacity to um, in, engage in monitoring through their role. And then there is this prospect of algorithmic oversight, automated uh, ways of overseeing behaviors uh, and triggering uh, responses then. Think about how behaviors are corrected, uh, more, more modification of behavior. The traditional mode is through responsive enforcement and the application of sanctions, of course, in supply chain contracts, we might have contractual sanctions. I've talked earlier about compliance officers in GDPR uh, and also within, within the DSA. Um, the EU has made a lot of uh, using enforcement networks as a mode of learning across uh, different countries, different regulators, uh, as to how to think about and address particular challenges. There's a range of economic instruments that are quite well developed in some areas, not only taxes and, and subsidies, but also fines and, and, and loans. I mentioned earlier the DSA proposals around liability rules and alternative dispute resolution. Very strong emerging literature suggesting smart contracts will provide a mechanism for uh, direct enforcement of not only substantive contractual norms, but also regulatory norms. Uh, this is referred to by some as the promise of Web 3.0 and in Roger Brownsword's work and the book of that name, uh, the promise of law 3.0 that combines technological ways of uh, correcting behaviors alongside legal mechanisms and looks at the interplay uh, uh, between the two. And then there are behavioral measures, um, one of which would be to encourage stronger digital literacy and, and uh, responsibility amongst consumers and citizens for what they do, which of course is crit criticized by some as being somewhat neoliberal uh, in approach, but I think there probably is a responsibility to for users of digital uh, platforms to take some responsibility around their own uh, learning capacity. Mm -hmm. And then think about review and revision. The fifth part of any policy cycle is to review what's happened and to revise. And there's a range of instruments here for doing that that I mentioned here. Um, and I'm not gonna detail, go into this, anything more about at this moment uh, in order to interest of time. So here's what a, the deployment of a toolkit might look like in terms of looking at the options at each uh, stage of uh, uh, regulatory policy uh, cycle, and we can map uh, both existing and proposed new areas of regulation using this tool and maybe identify gaps uh, uh, in opportunities that are not being taken or maybe are, are present but not being discussed, not being highlighted uh, through using a toolkit approach. So I'm going to conclude with a, just a brief uh, summary. Uh, your preliminary uh, implications first for research and second for policy. In terms of research, this approach gives a somewhat, I argue, more realistic recognition of the distribution of power. 
and capacity within the digital policy sphere. It implicates more organizations and actors as playing a role in uh, regulation. But there is a limit to toolkit approach because it assumes that there is someone in control who is knowledgeable and competent. Uh, the more advanced theoretical literature talks about the search for interpolable balance uh, defined as the need to determine self-correcting mechanisms that are already present in the system. And an array of other complementary controls can be added and there may be overlap, um, but the suggestion is it may be wrong to assume that control is exercised exclusively from a fixed point within the system. In other words, there may be a degree of hubris about EU or indeed national state policymakers and regulators thinking they can control a whole system where we know from experience in the digital world that behaviors are maybe unpredictable and indeed preferences may be you know, unpredictable such that no one is in control overall. That's a rather terrifying prospect, of course, for policymakers and indeed for, for legislators. And so it tends to get downplayed. But um, I mean, the Christian has recently talked about an ecosystem of trust, which I think does imply uh, perhaps the idea that there's no one in overall control. And uh, Destrell and Ledger in recent work have talked about an ecosystem of oversight to, to, to match that. Concluding then just with some of the uh, policy implications, the toolkit approach involves the search for best capacity and joining up of capacity, search for best fit of instruments, but it is not about displacing self-regulation with state regulation, or indeed vice versa. And your one possible you know, way I can conclude from a policy perspective would be to say that the implications of the toolkit approach would be to look for areas where we need more hierarchy, so more centralized oversight in EU, in EU agencies and, and national regulators, but also within, within organizations such as firms. We might need more competition-based instruments, more rivalry over standards or subsidies or taxes as mechanisms for steering behaviors. We might need more community-based instruments, such as engagement over the making and implementation of codes on internet content and the role of NGOs in monitoring behaviors. And we might need more design-based instruments, so behavioral instruments, but also uh, greater consideration of the way that smart contracts and law 3.0 might change the landscape and how uh, state agencies might respond to a recognition of more of that sort of activity through uh, regulation through design. I'm going to stop there. I've gone on a bit long, um, but uh, I think Kenneth's going to uh, now, now join in and I'll stop sharing. <laughs>